Good evening, everybody, and welcome to CDE Virtual. I'm going to ask Sipa Maseko, CEO of Telcom and CDE board member, to kick us off this evening. Sipa, over to you. You're muted. You're muted. Good evening, Anne. Good evening to everybody, and good evening as well to Sir Mick Davis. And uh, welcome to this event this evening. Tonight, I suppose we are hosting the final event for 2021, which is the 13th event in this series. We've had a year of very excellent contributions by a range of speakers, international and South African, all of whom are experts in their field and have had a lot to share with us. The response to invitations to these events have been more than exceptional and positive feedback we have received regarding the value of these discussions prompted this board to urge the executive director to continue this series beyond just the celebration of CDE's 25 years. Founded in 1995, the organization has recently turned 26. I've been a board member since 2008. I've been with CDE for longer than I've been at Telcom, which in itself is a milestone. I'm always impressed with the contribution this think tank makes to South Africa policy debates. <clears throat> the products that reach the public are thoroughly grounded in research and evidence. They're fact-based, they're of the highest quality, and they're always very carefully tested with a range of stakeholders. We always try to offer new perspectives, different ways of approaching things, and often this is based on what we have learned from talking to people and listening to what they have to say. I'm also delighted that CDE is a center of ideas and national policies and, enga and, and engages with grassroots organizations. For example, they are currently running an experimental project, seeing how they can provide support to small business organizations so that their voices and concerns can be heard and much more loudly in metro and national and parliamentary conversations. CDE is all about growth and inclusion. How do we make this a more prosperous society for all South Africans? And how do we expand opportunities for the bottom half of our society, both urban and rural, more, loudly, more, more especially people who have been ex excluded from everything so many of us take for granted. I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation and we'll now hand over to yourself, Anne, who will formally introduce Sir Mick and start the interview. Over to you, Anne. Thank you very much, Sipo. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Sir Mick Davis tonight to South Africa, albeit only on Zoom, and to the Center for Development and Enterprise. A former South African businessman, CEO of the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom for a few years, global mining dealmaker, and a former member of the ESCOM top team in those faraway days when we had a surplus of power. Thank you for joining us in this series of conversations. It's great to have you. Thanks, Anne. Lovely to be with you. I'm going to cover some big topics in our hour together. I want to explore your thoughts on mining companies and more broadly on business and society, on corruption, and then look at South Africa more in more detail. I understand that you and I share an admiration for the wonderful American author, Doris Kearns Goodwin, who's written many books, including a fabulous book on the beginning of media muckraking the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt and, and the media. Um, but I know that you particularly like another book of hers about Abraham Lincoln, a very famous book, The Team of Rivals. Can you tell us why you like that book in particular? Yeah, well, I, well first of all, I, I'm a sort of great admirer for, of Abraham Lincoln and the impact he actually had on, uh, on, on, on the restructuring of American society. Um, but I think the important thing was that he, he put together a cabinet of people who actually didn't initially like him and didn't rate him. Um, you know, Stanton, who is his secretary for war, 
um, thought he was a champ initially. They had uh, sparred together as, as, as lawyers before um, Lincoln got into the presidency and he hadn't impressed. But he and, and uh, but he recognized in Stanton a, a, a supreme intellect and, a, and an organizational capability. And so he went out of his way to bring him into the cabinet as he did with other cabinet members. And he built common cause um, with them uh, to foster the interests of, of, of the then United States. And um, I think that's a, a lesson for all politicians today, that you, you, know, you to surround yourself with people who are simply going to be sycophantic and not challenge you is a recipe for disaster. And we see that in so many countries, but to surround yourself with people who challenge you, have intellect, you have capacity, uh, is an enormous way of actually creating value. And, I, and that's, a, that's an important proposition for business as well. Great, I couldn't agree more. Um, now for someone involved in big mining deals around the world and your new venture into battery technology and development, you clearly need a big picture and a big understanding of global developments and trends. So perhaps we can kick off with your thinking about China, about India, and about, of course, about Africa. What are the prospects? How do you see it? How are you thinking about these really big issues? Well, if I, if I think about China, I mean, obviously China um, was uh, was central to to my success in business because it was a trend of, of of its industrialization and the moving of hundreds of millions of people from an agrarian society into um, an urban society, which triggered uh, my conviction on, on how we should actually grow extrata and build extrata as, as the mine, into the mining company it became. And it was the central function that although commodities or, or metals intensity in GDP in the developed world was going to decline, in China it was going to go up and it was going to erupt and it would dominate um, demand going forward. And that was a thesis in which we built extrata. Uh, and the growth uh, of China was therefore a, a fundamental proposition. And in that growth, clearly, was going to come a society which was going to become increasingly complex. Um, and you know, the this trade-off that you have in, in between sort of economic freedom, political freedom, plays itself out in China almost every single day. Um, on the basis that um, that at the moment, the, the proposition, certainly the fundamental proposition under Xi's leadership is that you can have an increasing amounts of economic freedom uh, provided you don't challenge for political freedom. And that in itself is constrained. But what I think is interesting in China today is it, it, that, that it clearly is about to enter into the demographic deficit or the consequences of the demographic deficit. Uh, not only, and this is not just the imbalance of of, of its, its, the skew in this population by virtue of the one, the one child uh, um, um, sort of um, policy, but the fact that more people are leaving the workforce and are coming into the workforce, wages being, uh, being, uh, being driven up. Uh, there isn't the, safety, the social um, uh, safety net that, that is apparent in, in other first world, in, in first world countries. And the question is, is China going to be rich enough soon enough to be able to cope with this demographic deficit. Um, and although people are concerned about the, the rise of China, and you can see the interplay between the United States and China, and, and almost you feel that the United States has an inferiority complex when it deals with China, because it's so far ahead of China in so many respects. But people concerned about the rise of China, will China become too dominant a player? Will it imbalance uh, the equilibrium in the, in the world? And my concern is actually the, the, fall, the failure of China. I'm more concerned about China failing than succeeding because I fear uh, uh, the consequence of, a, of an economy which is not, does not become rich enough, which cannot deal with the demographic deficit. We'll see rising tensions in that society, we'll see greater unrest, and the, the, the tendency of political leadership around the world to deflect domestic problems into externalities then becomes very great. And, it, and that really could, does concern me. So China is a potential area of worry, not because they are succeeding too much, is because they might not succeed enough. Um, India is, of course, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the world's uh, uh, economy, which always has the greatest promise and the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest uh, capacity never to deliver. Um, and I think it's an interesting contrast. I mean, there it has a demographic advantage um, and smart people, um, but yet the Byzantine nature of its politics sort of weighs down on its capacity 
uh, to break free of what it is a, a, a continuing a dominant agrarian economy. You know, when, this, when the monsoons are good, India does well. When the monsoons are bad, they don't do so well. And they have enormous productivity issues because they just can't address the infrastructure. And I think the combination of, of, a, of a federal government, um, which is not free of the sort of bureaucratic constraints, which they sort of inherited from the British and then perfected, uh, and with the, 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 the inability to actually deal with um, the, the power of the states, the individual states, makes India a country which, uh, uh, I'm afraid, uh, always uh, sort of flatters but never delivers. Um, so that, you know, so India is, is, is always on the cusp of having a significant influence on in the world economy, but never quite, never quite getting there. Um, you know, the, 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 the you, you have to, I guess, you know, I, I try and, I, I've always tried to create my business perspective based on a set of convictions. Um, and, and, and I think the challenge that we have today is that forming a conviction is quite difficult. And certainly for Africa, which was your final continent, it's very difficult to actually form a conviction. And I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm really not sure where it happens. It's so easy to, uh, you know, to, to be negative and to say that, you know, sort of the much of Africa is, is sort of disappearing into, in, into the abyss, you know, enormous population growth, not sufficient growth in, in, in education, which is relevant to operating economies in, in the technological world. So they, con they will continue to be sort of underperformers um, with that deficit, uh, insufficient infrastructure uh, to, support, to support growth, you know, significant corruption, um, you know, poor governance, all of that contributes to big challenges with Africa. Um, and yet, it is a continent with enormous advantages. I mean, again, you have a young population, strongly consumer oriented population. Um, you sort of feel that if they just get, you know, 25% of the stuff that they need to, the ingredients for, for, for healthy growth right, then the, the continent has much to offer. Uh, right now, I'm, 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 I'm sort of more negative than positive. Hmm. Interesting. Let me ask you about another big issue quickly. Um, your view on climate change. Everybody's talking about this. Are we actually going to do what has to be done, whatever that might be? You've called this a secular change. And I wanted to ask what you meant by that. Um, OK, so, so, so on climate change itself, I mean, are people serious about it? Well, you know, we've, we've had enough sort of um, statements by the G7, by the G20, by now, you know, the nations that, that, that are in Glasgow for COP26 saying that they want to achieve uh, a situation going forward where global warming is limited to one and a half percent above the sort of 1880 base year, which is the year that they've chosen to be the dividing line between the pre and post industrial age. And that is one hell of an objective. I mean, you know, that, that requires the sort of the current, you know, sort of um, 60 gigatons of, uh, 60 million gigatons of, uh, of, of CO2 that we pump into the atmosphere every day uh, to reduce to below 30. And, and that's a 58%, almost 60% reduction. And I'm sort of not sure that people quite understand what that actually means. It means a fundamental uh, discontinuity in the way that we um, source our energy and the way that we use our energy. Um, and certainly the plans that they have at the moment are never going to achieve that. And um, I think it's a great goal. Um, I don't think I'll see it actually in my lifetime. Um, and, uh, but it does, as I said, it requires very significant things. And the, I mean, currently the only way you can address this is to reduce the amount of uh, electricity you produce from fossil fuels. So, so currently, uh, renewable energy makes up about 25% of the primary energy mix. And given that nuclear, although politicians are now speaking about it again with some favor, it does not have a political mandate. And it will take a hell of a lot for it to get a political mandate, because quite honestly, uh, we can all theoretically say, well, nuclear should be the answer as long as you don't build it next to my house. Um, and, and so given that nuclear doesn't have a political mandate, and even, even if tomorrow the you know, politicians could reach common cause with their citizens that nuclear is the way to go, it will take 15 years before we have a serious uh, injection of nuclear power 
into the mix. So it has to come from renewable energy, which means that your renewable energy has to go from 25, 26% a day to something 85, 90% by 2050. And that can only come from really solar and uh, offshore and onshore wind. I mean, hardware is not going to be uh, a significant component of that. And the more you actually introduce this type of renewable energy into the system, so you create in electricity grids more and more instability because it's intermittent in nature. And so therefore you have to have a significant amount of, of, of sort of backstop capacity to smooth out this, this, this supply into the grid. Now that can't come from fossil fuels because that sort of defeats the whole objective. And if it's not coming from nuclear, where is it going to come from? So it has to come from very, very large scale battery storage systems. So that's sort of vanadium redox batteries or, or lithium phosphate batteries. And then, you know, I think quite rightly, um, you know, the political and social network has determined the internal combustion engine should become obsolete. And we must drive, uh, we must do transportation with electric vehicles. And I say it's right because transportation sits at the heart of almost everything we do in life. We go to, we go to the office in a motor car or in a bus or in a train. We, we have our food delivered, we shop. We, go to re we use transportation for recreation. So change in the way that we use transportation is a fundamental proposition in getting people to understand they have to live their lives in a different way. But you know, we've got 5 million electric vehicles on the road today. If we want to get anything like the, the goal, it's going to be like you know, 300 million in 20 years' time. That requires an extraordinary amount of gigawatt hours stored in batteries. So where's this all going to come from? Yeah, and because given the fact that the supply side of the industry is um, sort of grotesquely unprepared to meet that, that level of demand. And, and if you think that the Chinese demand for commodities as a result of industrialization was, was, was significant, this is much more significant. This will dwarf Chinese demand. Um, and so you'll need sort of lithium to go up, I don't know, sort of 40 times, lithium supply to go up 40 times. You'll need um, cobalt to go up um, a significant amount. You'll need graphite to go up 25 times. You'll need earths to go up seven times. And these are, these are just mind-boggling amounts of additional capacity which you need to bring into the system. So are they serious about it? Yes, I think they are. And the reason why I think they're serious about it because we actually have not just politicians, you know, sort of pumping out rhetoric, um, you know, because it satisfies an agenda. You have this coalition of the political, the, politi the political world, yeah, the uh, um, activists, the providers of capital, the man in the street, all of us have come to the simple, the simple conclusion that a sustainable environment to sustain life in the way that we want it to be lived on this planet requires a significant reduction in the carbon footprint. So I think the intent is serious, but I think we are hopeless in terms of, of, of addressing the real issues which need, to, uh, which need to deliver on that objective. And that, that for me is a big, uh, big concern. So you, you ask a question, why do I talk about a secular change in demand? Is because I, yeah, the mining industry is an industry which, which actually operates in, in cycles. As we know, that's a business cycle. GDP goes up, demand for commodities generally will go up. It will depend what structured economy you're into, how much it will go up. But that's, that's the nature of the business. Here, we're talking about something which is entirely different. The demand is not driven by my projection of strong GDP growth in the world, nor is it driven by another large country like India industrializing. It's actually driven by a, a revolution in the way that we, we use energy. And that revolution is independent of, 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 of where GDP might be at a point in time. And that's why it's secular, because you, you have a structural, a secular change to the demand curve, which lifts up irrespective of the business cycles. Wow, thank you. Um, I'm going to move now to, I don't know, less secular things, but <laughs> I want to <laughs> I want to talk about about business. Um, one of the big advantages of business, I think, is that it can operate in very different governments and regimes around the world. And this can sometimes be very uncomfortable. So what is your view on mining companies operating in anti-democratic regimes, often very corrupt societies, such as Guinea? Um, how do you think about this? What are the trade-offs and how, how does one, how do you deal with this? 
Well, let me let me let me make a a, a generalized observation um, that the descent into evil is done. It happens in very small, graduated steps. So you start off living a virtuous life. And given the externalities that you face, you make a series of small compromises to enable you to actually operate or live your life within, those, within that environment. And because they're small changes, compared to where virtue is, um, the first change, well, we sort of there, it's not, so, it's not so bad. And then you make another change compared to where you were before, and that's not so bad. By the time you've actually got down the slippery slope, you're so far from being virtuous, that you actually are in the uh, the cesspit of evil, and that's the challenge that business faces, like human beings face. That's the chase that, uh, that's the challenge that business faces as well. So we we enter into geographies because that's where God put the resources. In the case of the mining industry, you can't, you know, that's that's where you have to be. You do so on the basis that you actually think you're performing a public good, because you can have a, a monumentally magnificent impact for the communities in which you operate in. You can change their lives. You can move them from subsistence uh, to sustainability. You can offer them value in terms of education and healthcare and, 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 and in fact, changing the structure of their societies and they become more sustainable. Um, you can produce commodities which are vital for the, word, uh, for the world and you feel that you're doing public good and making a return for your shareholders. And you can do it actually in the mining industry, although people think you can't. You can do it in an environmentally benign way. You can not have a, a dramatically permanent detrimental impact on your environment. And so that's why we do it. Um, and we go to countries where, where, where the commodities are, and we take a view that we can manage the governance within those countries, um, and that we can find accommodations which allow us to do it in a way which doesn't, in fact, compromise our principles. And most of the time, that is possible. Uh, but some of the time it is not. And I can't tell you at what point you take the view that you shouldn't be there. It certainly can't be on the basis that you will only operate in what we understand to be a democracy, because then we won't, we won't be producing the commodities the world requires. I mean, you know, they are in complex geographies where, where views of, of people's rights and the rights of society and the rights of the individual vary and change. Um, but there are some, I guess, some, 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 some absolutes which you, which, you can't, which you can't and should not break. I mean, where, 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 where people in society are differentially treated, uh, where some are preferred and some are not preferred, um, where governance is so bad that, in fact, you cannot operate unless you, in fact, are, 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 are engaged in, in, in large-scale and ongoing corruption, where you have to pay people off, where you have to sacrifice the interests of one group of people to satisfy the interests of the other. And, uh, and those, I mean, you know, in the, in, in the times that I've operated, I've tried to recognize that. And so there have been some geographies which I said, I can't possibly operate in because I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't know how to actually um, mitigate the risks of going down uh, this sort of rabbit hole, uh, which, you, which you sort of have described. Um, and so I sort of take them out of my equation. And but feel in other geographies which are complex, where, where democracy in terms of a, a Westernized set of values would not be recognizable, yet society functions in a way where people are treated equally and individuals can in fact prosper and governments are actually not acting uh, uh, to the detriment of the communities, but they're actually acting for all, and they might not be acting the way that I would choose them to act. Um, and so I, I think it's a, it's a very it's a very complex question. I can't give you, you know, a, a beautiful off pat answer. I can just know that it's a dangerous place to be, and you have to be constantly alert. Otherwise, you slowly, slowly slip slip down that 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 greasy pole into a period, into a space where you know you shouldn't be when you finally worked out you're there. Hmm. Interesting answer. Um, it's, in, it's unusual in South Africa for business leaders, real entrepreneurs and money makers to go into politics. Why did you decide to get involved in a political party in the UK? How did you adjust to the realities of politics? And well, what would your advice be to any other business person deciding to get into politics? Besides don't. <laughs> well, I, I got engaged with, with the Conservative Party um, 
again, because I, I guess I operate out of certain convictions uh, and, 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 and defined propositions. And that when, when Jeremy Corbyn became the leader of the Labour Party, um, and um, I, I took the view that that was a dangerous thing to be happening because his value system, I thought was corrupt. Um, and I thought it was dangerous for British society. And to be frank, I thought it was, a, it was dangerous for me as a Jew. And I couldn't contemplate a world where he became prime minister if I did not, in fact, try and do something about stopping him. So that was the point number one. Point number two was after the 2017 general election, it became quite, became quite apparent to me that the Conservative Party had lost its capacity, its campaign capacity. So its ability to actually campaign effectively as a political party had been lost. And that when the next general election came, if it had not rebuilt that camp capacity, it would lose. And therefore we'd result in, in what I felt would be a disastrous outcome. Um, and so I, um, I basically approached Theresa May straight off that election on the Friday after the election and said that she needed to professionalize the running of, of, of uh, the Conservative Party, that she needed a non-aligned political person, in the sense aligned as a politician within, within the political system to come in and run it. She needed a person who knew and how to run big systems. And, uh, and that unless she did that, uh, she would not be able to rebuild the party's capability to, to run elections. And so she said to me, well, that's very well, but who's going to do it? And I said, well, I'm prepared to do it. Um, and I'll do it for a couple of years. Um, and try and deliver this campaign organization. And you must bear in mind, I, I really knew very little about how politicians behaved. I mean, I learned very quickly I, <laughs> yeah, once I took over the job. And I knew very little about the party dynamic. But what I do know is I know how to run a big system because I've run big systems all my life. And that's what I went to do. I went to run the system and identified the fact that we needed to refresh campaign capability on the ground. In other words, find a whole bunch of new activists who we could deploy across the country in key seats so that they would actually be, develop, be able to develop the, the strategies and the conversations that we needed to have with the electorate on the ground. And I also determined that you couldn't act in today's world without understanding the data and the information. And that we needed to collect the data and information about the electorate across the country and utilize all the, all the, the wonderful uh, techniques that that uh, AI and 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 uh, gives you to interrogate that data and determine what sort of person, what are the characteristics of a person who could in fact vote for the Conservative Party, and what would they need to understand about that party's agenda for them to vote? How could you actually have that conversation with them? And once you've had the conversation, how could you actually get them into the polling booth? Because that's often where everything breaks down. So people who could vote for you actually don't go and vote. Um, and so I, 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 I essentially got the, 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 um, the party to focus in on those two specific objectives. And I was, you know, and, and we ran that as a proposition for two years. And so when Boris Johnson became prime minister and called the election in November, um, of, uh, of, 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 of 2019, he had a campaign organization which was at the very top of its game. And although he himself was a great campaigner and, and you know, a huge amount of credit must go to him for winning that election in the way that he did, it would not have happened had we not had the activist base on the ground, the campaign managers on the ground, and it would not have happened if we did not know which people to send them to what the conversation that they needed to have was, how they should engage with them through social media or other, and how on the day to actually get them out to vote. Um, mm. So that drove me into the party. I also became the first person who he fired, incidentally. Um, so, so I had that distinction. I had that <laughs> distinction as well. Having said that, I mean, you asked me, should business, bus business people get into politics? Undoubtedly, business people should be engaged in politics. And in there, are, there are countries like France, for instance, where there is a natural flow in and out of the political process in the business community. Um, and in this country, business people in, the, in, in days gone by, Margaret Thatcher's government, in, in Ted Heath's government, and Harold Wilson's, where a lot of business people used to be in politics and used to be in the cabinet. It's only become a very recent phenomenon 
in the UK that that politics has become the domain of the of the professional politician who comes from university, uh, becomes a special advisor, goes into parliament and stuff like that. But gee, I think that business people and people from other walks in life, academics and, 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 and other people should be engaged in the political process because politicians are supposed to represent the people and they can't represent the people if they don't actually understand the sort of natural way that people live their lives and business people are part of that. And as I said, academics are part of it. Um, sports people are part of people like this should be engaged in politics. So I, I think politics shouldn't be the domain of, of the sort of the professional activist and politician. But I think more so in a country which has challenging, govern challenging governance and existential issues that it has to deal with. And that's where South Africa is at the moment. South Africa has massive governance issues and massive existential issues that it has to deal with. And if the good business community stay back and remain silent, well, then I think they're doing a great disservice to the country. So whether they become engaged politically with parties or they become vocal with parties, they need to do that. They need to be, they need to be upfront and they need to actually step forward because if they don't do that, you know, I think the country's done. Ah, well, um, I have a few jobs I would love you to take over for a few years. <laughs> Let's not go there. One of the one of the big themes of the Theresa May's short sort of prime ministership was about business and society. I was struck that how early on she in talks to the Confederation of British Industry and elsewhere, she talked about this issue. And she had some, some novel sort of twists to, to this, this theme. Let me ask you one of the big issues which applies, I think, in a lot of countries and certainly in South Africa. How, how do you think companies or business should and could establish more legitimacy in the societies in which they operate? That doesn't mean they have the least legitimacy of all, but how do you think about this issue? So I'm, I, 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 I've always believed, and in fact, I, I was in sync with a lot, a lot of what Teresa was trying to do, although I didn't agree with every aspect of, 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 of the sort of individual things that she was coming up with, but I, I certainly a, a, a believed in her, in her thrust and her, her policy objective that, that capitalism, of which the, the, the business community you know, sits as the, as the, the emblematic flag, um, can only survive uh, if we create a society where we don't have the few prospering and the majority looking in from the sides, wondering how they get a piece, a legitimate piece of the action. And unfortunately, the way that the, that, that the world of work is developing, given the structural changes that are taking place in society, where you know um, electronic um, yeah, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the utilization of 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 of, 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 of computer technology, etc., seems to dominate the creation of, of future jobs, and that's where the high value jobs, people doing the mundane, are now become the low value jobs. And unless you have a high value job, you don't prosper. And if you have a low value job, your your, your living standards seem to go down. So we're creating a society where people are, are essentially have an essential feeling of unfairness. They don't actually have equal access and they don't have the capacity to actually uh, trade up with social mobility as was maybe the case uh, in, in the past. Um, and the business community therefore, I think plays an important role in this because you know, if they want a, a free market society where markets in fact are gonna determine how prices and allocation resources, and they want the ability to prosper in that environment, then they have to make sure that they are seen as a force for public good, um, which means that you cannot simply have um, generating the highest possible return for your investors as being the only metric, because you have to recognize that your success in business comes from a range of stakeholders contributing, simplistically your employees, your customers, but also the society in which you actually live and the people who constitute that society. And that you therefore have to recognize that you have to deliver a value in return 
to they stake, those stakeholders as well, because if they contribute, they're entitled to get that value and that return. And so if business have to, I think, think very deeply about how they can be a force for public good. Now, up to now, um, you know, the response of the business community has been sort of formulaic. So they've developed a social development fund and they dole out a check here and a check there. They get lots of publicity. I mean, they write the annual reports. They, you know, they sort of reflect that publicity that we funded this football field. We built that hospital. And all of that is great. I mean, I, I don't want to denigrate you know, anything which, which ultimately adds value to society, but that's not what it is. It's something much more profound than that. It is a, a fundamental contribution to society itself actually growing in a way which is in favor of all the citizens. Now, not everybody's going to be a millionaire, but everybody should be entitled to the opportunity of getting a decent education, of being capable of contributing in a technological uh, um, environment and economy, of being able to take themselves out of poverty into a, a, a sense of, of, of at least middle class without being constrained by, 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 by society holding them down. Um, and all these things, I think that business in fact can contribute to. And I think the contribute to one is by joining the debate of government and how that in a policy sense should be achieved, but joining the debate in terms of how they contribute in their town, in their suburb, in their community, and what role they play in that. Um, and what role therefore they play you know, from a general point of view. Now, I, I'll just give you one, let me hone in one example, which I think is important, which uh, I, I feel strongly about. I mean, the one area where business has not only a legitimate right to participate, but almost has an obligation to participate in terms of their own survival is education. Because unless they have properly educated people who are equipped, they will not be able to be productive and effective and profitable going forward. But yet, and this is not just a challenge for South Africa, it's a challenge all around the world, we have massive education deficits where people come out of schools ill-equipped to contribute valuably to society as we know it today. But business could change that. They could actually be part of a growing mechanism to invest in education at schools, both in terms of the provision of relevant materials to be taught, but also in the provision of making sure that they find and support the most outstanding people to be teachers, role models for young people to emulate. And they could do that, for instance, under the Teach First programs where they, you know, they provide the backstop to young people to go to teach you can, you know, you can present as these exciting role models for young people in the knowledge that when they're in their thirties, they have a job in a business which is meaningful and productive for them going forward, that they can actually also be on the value creation ladder. And many years ago in South Africa, I sort of proposed to the then president um, that, um, that this is one thing that, and I was running extra, that I would be prepared to actually, you know, canvas amongst my fellow business leaders that we become solidly engaged in addressing the education deficit in South Africa. And this was before um, Zooms and, and Teams and stuff like took off, but we, we, we were starting out with the whole question of, you know, having these video conference facilities. And I said, you have technology today where we can bring the best teachers in the world into classrooms into South Africa. And they don't actually have to live in South Africa. They can be living in Singapore, the United States or England or wherever. And you can find the best math teachers, the best English teachers, the best science teachers, because we have a technology to project them into the classroom and that we can provide that quality to our learners. And I said that in my view, from a business point of view, I'd be prepared to fund the construction of relevant classrooms and technology to allow that to happen. You just basically create the arrangements for it to happen. We'll find the teachers. Um, it, it was a, an offer which was, uh, which was not taken up. But yeah. it, those are the sort of things that I think that business should be doing, because I think that's where business can play an important role. About a decade ago, I read a study of what was taught in German schools and universities about business. And it was absolutely stunning. It had been written by, I don't know, the most left-wing person you can think of, that business was evil, that multinationals were evil and doing evil all over the world. And so your, one of your points about what, what is taught is, couldn't be more important in my view, um, but not enough attention is paid to that. Um, I'm gonna come back to, to business in South Africa in a moment.
Let me ask you about business and Brexit. I've heard it said that business opposition to Brexit was a case of too little, too late. What is your view on Brexit? And what role did organized business play in how this decision eventually turned out? So, you know, it, it is difficult to, to, to give you a uniform master as to what business did, because I can tell you that I had business people who are you know, vehemently opposed to Brexit and business people who were, um, you know, unbelievably enthusiastic. I had you know, people in the financial services industry who wanted Brexit and people who didn't. Uh, people in, 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 uh, in, in the manufacturing industry, et cetera. So it is very difficult to find a uniform approach to Brexit because Brexit was, in, inform, was informed um, in, in different ways in people's mind. Um, so my own personal position on Brexit was that although I thought the European, and I still think the European Union is a flawed institution, not in its conception, but in the way it runs. Um, and it actually, uh, by, by its, it, its imposition of regulation, it creates cost um, and value destruction as opposed to um, value creation. But as a political social entity, I think it's actually very important. And I wanted to, and I wanted to succeed. And I did not want the UK to withdraw from it. And I didn't want UK to withdraw from it principally for two reasons. First of all, um, yeah, the withdrawing from our biggest market just didn't seem to make much sense. I mean, I couldn't understand this concept that you separate from your biggest trading block on the hope and expectations you can form some other trading deals with individual countries, which is a crazy proposition. And that crazy proposition has turned out to be a reality today. There's no, there's no great trade deal with the United States, and I doubt if there ever will be. Um, the second thing was, I thought it was a, 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 a sort of venture into uh, um, a future which we couldn't determine, and therefore that was risky. And why would you actually want to create risk? I mean, the, the job in our lives is actually to scale down risk, not to double down on risk. Um, and, and thirdly, because I thought that if we exited the European Union, um, a moderating force for good, which the UK generally was, would be, would be lost. Um, now, many people, um, including business people who supported Brexit, did so on the basis of a, a, a vision that they needed sovereignty to be returned to the United Kingdom. That we were no longer a sovereign nation, we are subject to the whim of the bureaucrats in Europe, and that was not right, and that was not conscionable. Others, and this was perhaps people who were working for those business people, wanted Brexit because they felt, in fact, that um, because of our membership of the European Union, there was untrammeled immigration into the country, and immigrants were reducing the real price of wages, were increasing the price of housing, were impacting on the ability of the state to provide them with effective services, et cetera. And they wanted, in fact, Bre Brexit to come in so they could actually build a proper border and that you control immigration much more effectively, and therefore they would not be competed out of jobs, out of salary, et cetera. Now, those are two widely different things that people wanted. So you had a left-wing, working-class, male Labour voter, and a right-wing, upper-middle-class, older male voter, wanting the same thing for entirely different reasons. So the, why did business, why was business not a significant force uh, in fighting Brexit? Because business was conflicted. You know, there wasn't a uniform thing. Um, and I think that the vote that David Cameron called, David is, is, is often criticized for calling the vote. He had no choice. You could argue that he maybe should have timed the vote for later in his uh, in, in, in the second term than, than, than he did. But you know, that's an issue which, in, with the benefit of hindsight, is easy to say. But the forces which gave rise to 55% of the people supporting Brexit actually were forces which were dominant and powerful, irrespective of when he called it and what he did and what the campaign was. Enough people came together for disparate reasons to create that, that outcome. I think it's a sad outcome because I think we're going to, there's a cost to be paid. Now, in the long term, is that cost significant? I'm not, I'm not smart enough to work that out. But certainly in the short term, it is. It's been hidden by COVID at the moment. But in, I have no doubt that it is going to contribute to rising cost of living, 
I've no doubt it's going to contribute to, to friction in trade and that cannot be good for the UK and it can be good for the people of the UK. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Let's move to South Africa now, um, more sort of intensely. The president appointed you in December 2018 to his task force on ESKIM and what to do about it. As I understand it, your team reported in February 2019, a report that has not been made public as far as I know. What is your view on ESKIM and how South Africa is handling it in the last few years? Is it in a death spiral? And what should the country do? How do you see this? So, so Eskom is a is a Greek tragedy, <laughs> in the sense that, uh, um, like all state-owned enterprises in South Africa, and in, you know that there is inevitability of decline and degradation, um, um, and and I think that's that is the case. Um, and and Eskom unfortunately is so large and so integral to the South uh, South African economy that its decline is potentially fatal. Uh, for, for the economy itself. Um, so I, I think that what we have here is um, clearly a, a built up over a period of, of years, um, a um, mismanagement of the utility generally, a loss of skills, um, a, um, uh, an element of significant corruption, which has raised the cost of its operations and created massive risks in terms of supply of key raw materials uh, has given rise to massive blowout of costs of the building of, 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 of capacity. Um, and all of this has come together, as, as, as you all know, in, in ongoing brownouts and, and ESKIM capacity to supply always been on the cusp. And the simple proposition is that there's just not enough spinning reserve in the ESKIM capacity to meet the needs of the South African economy. And as a result, it has contributed to the decline of the South African economy. And the fact that you're sending less electricity today than you did 10 years ago uh, is, is, a, is a factor of that. No, no economy should be in that position. Um, it's also inhibited the growth of businesses and it's prevented some businesses from being established and it's raised the cost base in South Africa. And I fear for South Africa because ESCOM is, can, can in fact fall over. And if it does fall over, the ability to, to rebuild it is, uh, I think, going to be somewhat limited. So I am really concerned. Having said that, there is no reason why Eskom cannot return to a situation where it can be a credible, reliable supplier of reasonable price electricity. There is no reason why that cannot happen. Eskom is a resolvable problem. There are some problems in South Africa which will take generations to resolve. This is not one of them. This can be done within a generation. This can be done within a 10-year period. And you can start right now. And, and let me say, I mean, I am hugely full of admiration for the current chief executive of Eskom and the battle that he's fighting and, 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 and the, 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 the initiatives that he's, that he's taking. But he will never be successful. He cannot be successful. And this is the purposeful response by government to do the right thing. And the right thing is to address the issue of Eskom's crippling debt and remove that burden in some appropriate way from the balance sheet so that Eskom, in fact, does not pay out such a significant amount on interest and finance charges, which inhibits its ability to address operational considerations. It needs to create an environment where municipalities which do not pay for the electricity are either forced to pay or the government has to step in and find a resolution to that. ESCOM cannot support non-payment. It doesn't have the capacity to do that. And fundamentally, it needs to address the issues of the skills of operating the current system. Running a power system is an art, it's not a science. It needs a huge amount of skill base. It needs people with experience. And I strongly believe that one of the ways of getting that experience is to go around the world and tap into the best operators you can find. And you find some of them are ex Eskom people and bring them in for a three year period, a sort of a proto team, which you helicopter into Eskom to work alongside the current Eskom personnel and train them as they actually re-perfect 
the, 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 the running of the system. So you start getting availabilities and reliabilities, which start matching standards, which allow you to actually produce um, at reasonable rates. The other factor that one needs to, one, one needs to bear in mind is that, that the engineering capability in this can be, be regenerated as well. All of that is possible if you're prepared to actually give the ESCOM management and ESCOM board a credible license to actually do that without government getting into the engine room. One of the biggest challenges for South Africa is the government believes it has to be at the epicenter of the economic and social system. Governments should not ever be at the epicenter. They should actually be creating the environment and the arrangements for the society itself, the market, businesses, to actually, do, to, to, to actually add the value. And one of the big impediments in ESCOM has been the constant changes of chief executive or board members and stuff like that, and the constant micromanaging by government. And that has to be taken away as well. So if you can address the debt, you can address the skill deficit, and also you can address the demand side management. I, I did suggest some, I have suggested some ways in which you can address demand side management to create more spinning reserves so you can actually get onto a, a program maintenance uh, a, a program so you don't actually have these, the, you know, the brownouts that you're having now through, um, uh, through uh, uh, units going offline uh, as a result of, of breakdowns and breakages. Um, and addressing the issue of, um, of, of how you transition from fossil fuel dominance to uh, renewable dominance over time. But that's going to be done over time. It's going to be done slowly because otherwise the cost of that will, will make, again, power prohibitively expensive. So my view is that support the current chief executive, allow him to, to, to employ the best management team that you can possibly find, bring in, bring in the best skills that you can, except that there are some people who work in ESCOM who basically shouldn't be there because they are redundant and deal with that trauma. And it is a trauma. It's a trauma for them. It's a trauma for ESCOM, it's a trauma for society, but deal with that trauma up front and, 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 and in, in an appropriate and, and passionate, compassionate way. And in, if you put those ingredients together, over a 10 year period, we can resurrect ESCOM from the current depths of despair that, we, that, that is in, into a utility which we can again be proud of as being one of the great utilities of the world. I really believe it can, be, can happen. One last thing, one of the ways that we can address the issue of insufficient capacity in the system is to not only allow private generation, but to positively encourage it. And the government over the last few years has done simply nothing to facilitate private generation coming into the system. And, uh, and it can do that again. You know, it speaks volumes about all its plans. You know, it needs to implement the plans. And if it does that, you know, there's a way out of this. Yes. Oh, well, we have this year managed to get some, some changes to allow for private generation, but it's all too slow and it hasn't and, yet and, happened. And, and, and not ambitious enough. Yeah, not ambitious enough um, in general. Um, well, let me ask you then, I understand you're looking for a location to build a new factory. Would you invest in South Africa today? Yeah, that, that's a that's a question pregnant with all sorts of potholes for me to fall into. Um, I, I tell you, let me. I'm going to say generally, investing in South Africa is quite a difficult proposition, and because there are so many risks that one has to try and actually quantify and work out if you can mitigate. Um, there's risks of what you know, What do you own? I mean, what is your ownership of something, um, especially in the mining industry? Because this whole question of um, Empowerment is, is an important and relevant question, a legitimate issue that, that I think has to be dealt with in this country. But if you have a situation where empowerment can change and you continuously have to fund new empowerment to maintain uh, an fully empowered status, you have to you then question, well, how much do you earn? The other question is how much of the rent do you actually get? Because you know, if, 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 if there's a variable in terms of what rent you get, you can't actually price your project. And one of the ways in which rent is extracted from the mining industry, when, it, when the mining industry almost has to step in and become the provider of services that go, local government should be providing to communities. And it's not right and it's not actually not fair. Um, the other thing that you need is, is, is reliable logistics, reliable power, reliable transport, um, ports that actually can function. 
So the cost of doing business actually in South Africa is rising and not going down. Um, so it's, it's, it's a difficult proposition. Um, and, and therefore, if, would I invest in something which is very energy intensive at the moment? The answer is absolutely not. Would I invest in an anode facility which requires some energy work, which is not energy, energy intensive, which is located um, you know, in, in, with good logistics infrastructure? Um, I would be prepared to take that risk, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I take that risk because I actually think that, you know, unless people like me are prepared to commit to South Africa, then I shouldn't be speaking on your program and, and pontificating about, you know, what, what, what should happen in South Africa. So I'm prepared, I am prepared to do that. So I'm prepared to take measured risk. But I can, I can tell you now that in terms of the way that the investor world out there view South Africa, they view South Africa as a country where risk has spiraled and it's very difficult to determine return. And in that environment, you know, getting significant foreign, domestic, foreign investment in the country is, uh, is, is, is pretty difficult to contemplate. Wow. So let's come to the big issue then. South Africa is in crisis on almost every front. We're in deep, deep trouble. What would be your advice to the president, to the country, as to how, how do you get out of this trouble for the country as a whole? So how would you think about this if you were running South Africa or advising the president? Well, I think that you know, it's not good enough to determine what, what the issues are they need to address. There's so many of them. You have to determine which are the most important and which are the ones you can actually address with where you can get a return in, in a reasonable period. Because what we're talking about here is not just solving the issues on the ground, but you actually have to solve issues which actually give a sense of hope that South Africa can once again recover into, into a country which can offer you know, growth, jobs, healthcare, poverty relief, et cetera, to the community at large. And so people need to see an issue being resolved, runs on the board, as it were. So I sort of think that you need to actually determine a strategic plan which says that we have these five key issues, whatever they are, whether it's, whether it's housing or own, property ownership, power to the people, education. Let's just choose those three as, a, as, 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 as big topics. Um, and I'm gonna leave out general poverty and healthcare and stuff like that for the moment. And then you need to say, okay, so what can you do with, the, with these issues? What are the realistic things you can do, which are not slaves to ideology, but which are slaves to practical delivery? where if you do something in a particular way, you know that you can add value to society, all of society, not preferring one over the other. Um, and, you know, so I've, I've spoken about what they can do with electricity. In my view, and let me the heresy on, on, on land, I think it's, it, it's, it is unconscionable, the current situation of land ownership in the country. It can't prevail. But this idea that you have to fiddle with the constitution and create an amendment, which is highly dangerous and highly speculative as to where it will end up as a solution is, is to my mind not true. You have sufficient land out there which is available to governments, whether they're, whether they're state governments or regional governments, to address the issue of people's ownership of land. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have, uh, to, you know, to, to share the ownership of a, of, of a game, a series of game lodges in the Sabi Sands. And I have the most wonderful person who acts as my tracker when I'm there. And he, over the last 15 years, has built his house step by step with money that he's earned on the game reserve. And it's taken him a hell of a long time because he can't get a bond. And he can't get a bond because he doesn't own the property. Now, can you imagine the impact you would have on his life if he could get title to that property? He suddenly would have an asset in his hand. He could raise finance off that asset. He could sell that asset. He could actually participate in the economy that we sort of understand and which has created wealth for all of us. So there are ways of dealing with the issue of land ownership which don't have to contemplate, you know, uh, 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 you know taking, taking land away from, from, from people on the basis that we need to expropriate uh, in extremists for no value and create that bogeyman out there. There are ways today which the government, if they prepare to move off the ideological basis on which they sit, which can address this. Now, I'm not saying that's, 
the, the only answer to the land question, and I'm being quite simplistic in, in addressing, but I'm trying to make a point about focusing where you can actually have important value very quickly. On the issue of education, I mean, I've, I've, today with Zoom and Teams, my God, my, this little stupid idea that I had a few years ago, today could be worked profoundly. You know, a, 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 a team between government and business and educators could be in a space of a few months establish this as a concept which can be practically applied and then go through school by school and do it and count your successes in ones or twos because after ones or twos are added up over a year they suddenly 300s and 400s and 500s and thousands of thousands of pupils are getting decent education and can contribute to the economy economy going um, uh, uh, going forward so yeah, there are there are there are ways in which we can address. But I, if I was the president, if I was advising the president, I would say to him, identify one or two things where you know if you act practically and eschew the ideology, you can have an impact. That's what I would do. And I would absolutely, if I was him, I'd get ahead of the curve. Lead people ahead of the people. You are standing in front of the people. Don't nudge them from behind. And I just feel that you know there there must be a thirst in South Africa from everybody to have a country which is gonna serve them, you know, in terms of the jobs that it offers, the services that it offers, the, you know, the, the, the life that it actually creates, um, if they have leadership which actually is ahead of them, showing them a credible pathway to achieve that. Any last words of advice, building on what you said earlier about business in general? What would you say to business leaders in South Africa? The country's in crisis. What should they be doing? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, sort of, I guess I have um, the requisite degree of arrogance that any successful businessman should have, but I'm not that arrogant to, you know, to, you know, to give sort of advice to businesses in South Africa. I think they're in a tough position. And I think that they have you know, played an incredible role in, in the current COVID crisis and in the solutions which they have come up with. Um, but I think that their business have to be robust in their debates with government. And they have to challenge the ideological basis which sits at the heart of the government's proposition that the state has to sit at the center. It does not. If they can fight that proposition, they can then find credible solutions which they can, in partnership with government, can take the country forward. And I would hope that they continue to do that and don't lose heart. Just continue to put that position down. But for business to be credible, you know, it has to be credible in a situation where it does not become part of, of a system which, is, you know, which, which allows people to attack their, their credibility and their integrity. And so they have to do it from a good space and they have to do it with a, a, set of, a, a core set of values which are inviolate uh, in, in the way that they actually have this discourse. So Mick Davis, thank you very much for spending an hour with CDE and all of our guests tonight. Uh, I've taken you all around the world and back to South Africa. And uh, I, I hope the audience has found this as fascinating, informative and thought provoking as I have. So thank you very much everybody for joining us this evening. And a very big thank you to SIPO for introducing this evening and especially to Mick Davis for sharing so much of what he's learned and thought uh, with us this evening. We're, we're now concluded. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mick. <laughs>